G'day and welcome back for another Space Engineers tutorial. Today we're going to be taking a look at pistons. The reason I want to take a look at pistons is they are a very useful way to set up a simple drilling rig attached to your base and when you've got a rover like this one where you've got a connector that needs to hook up to the base in order to transfer all our materials, you may need pistons in order to line it up properly so that connector can attach. The first thing we're going to do is fly up the top here and attach a piston on top of our O2H2 generator. I'm going to use that spot since it's available and it's pointing in the direction that we want for a drill rig. In our G menu, find our piston and add it. And then having a look at the bottom of it, you'll see that there is a conveyor port. There's one on the top as well. However, the holographic representation you see here doesn't include the top piston part. The top piston part will be created when we place down the piston, as you can see here. We've now got this segment up here, and if I weld that up, it has a conveyor port on it. This segment that I've welded is a subgrid. That means it's a grid that will move relative to our main grid. In this case, our main grid is static, so it's all gonna be quite stable, but you can also have subgrids attached to mobile grids. So if I went to place another piston on here, I've now created a subgrid containing this piston and a further subgrid holding the next piston part. The more we do this, the more chance we have of things becoming unstable. Get rid of that since we don't really need it right now and we'll weld up this piston and have a closer look at it. If you're going to use pistons to collect resources early on, make sure you've already got an assembler since you need steel tubes for them. And without the assembler, you won't be able to get those components. Now, if we have a look inside the control panel of our piston, and I've rotated myself so we can still see what happens to the piston as I play with things, you'll see that you've got a bunch of different controls here. If you're looking in the piston and the controls seem a bit different, that could be because you're not in experimental mode. I would usually recommend people enable experimental mode. This will mean things like scripts can work and you can use mods, but you just have to be aware that by doing so, your performance may be impacted by some of the things that become enabled. Scripts can do terrible things to the performance of your game, and so can mods, but they can also add great things to our game, so it's something you just have to make your own decision on. But if you're wanting to have the options such as share inertia tensor in here, and the ability to push some of your values into the red zone, you can exit out of your game, and in the main menu, go to options, game, and enable experimental mode here. Yes, I want to continue, and then you'll have all those options available to you. And now let's get back to our controls. Reverse simply changes the velocity from negative to positive or positive to negative, and you can see over here an indicator showing our current position of the piston head. 10 meters extension is our maximum for large grid, and 2 meters is our maximum extension for small grid. If we increase our velocity, we're still not moving because we've reached our maximum distance. If I click reverse, we'll move back to our minimum distance at five meters per second. If I set our maximum distance to five, we'll only move out to there and then it will stop. This can be handy for certain situations such as when we're building our connector for our rover. If we continue down from this section, we've then got our maximum impulse axis and our maximum impulse non-axis. The maximum impulse axis is the force that is applied to extend and retract the piston. Non-axis is the force that the piston can apply to move itself back to that straight line extension and retraction. In other words, how hard it will resist bending. The higher this is set, the higher the chance you have if you collide with something that the piston will simply push through it. That will cause an explosion of either what's connected to the piston, what it's running into, or both, and many other things beside them. So it's something to be aware of, but it is something you will sometimes have to increase in order to overcome other forces such as gravity if you have a very large structure to move. Up here we've got two final things for our piston. If the piston head gets removed, much as with a wheel, you can replace it by clicking add piston head. And then we have our piston head back. Then the final thing we have is share inertia tensor. To really demonstrate this, I'm going to build the rest of our basic drill rig. The reason I wanted to start with a piston going upwards is I want this thing to be extended to its maximum range right from the beginning. By having this extended out to 10 meters, anything I build at the top can be brought down and in the case of a drill, pushed down into the ground when I retract this piston down to its collapsed state. 
So if I go and grab a couple of conveyor tubes and place them on top here, bring them off to the side, make sure we've got plenty of clearance between this and the base, and then point it downward. By extending our first piston, I've now created room to place two more here. Place two pistons here and then place a drill on the bottom. Large grid drills are pretty big, so I don't think we've got enough room to place a third piston before we would hit the ground. And this would be my most basic of drill setups. This thing will be able to push the drill 30 meters into the ground or 30 meters minus the distance between the drill and the ground at the moment. And that should collect us a decent amount of stone. Sadly, once it's done that, it won't be able to do much more, but at least it'll be a start. So if you're early on in the game, this can be a relatively cheap way of building this. The most expensive part of this construction is our drill itself. Needing 180 steel plate, you need a fair bit to put one together. At the end of the video, I'm going to go through some other ways of building these drill rigs, some of which might be more efficient and easier to build early on in the game because you won't need to build these large drills. So let's weld this up so we can get to drilling the ground. Something worth noting is that these piston parts are easy to miss when you're constructing something like this. And if you go to your drill and you can't move things into your personal inventory from places you should be able to, make sure you haven't missed any of them and weld them up as the conveyor system won't work without them being finished. Now to make them functional, all you need is the steel plate. You do not need the large steel tubes, which on tighter personal inventory sizes can be quite handy because large steel tubes take up a lot of space it's a bit of a hassle to have to carry around eight of them for each piston part. Now that we've got this built, let's turn our drill on so that we can take a proper look at share inertia tensor. By default in Space Engineers, tools will shake like this drill is doing now and drills are particularly bad culprits for this. To reduce the amount of shake that you're seeing over there, we can enable share inertia tensor on our pistons. As I enable it here, it's a little more rigid and then if I turn it on on both of these as well, you'll see that it almost has no shake at all. What share inertia tensor does, as you can see in the tooltip, is equalizes virtual masses of connected grids to achieve more stable behavior. That's pretty hard to understand, or at least I've always struggled to understand exactly what they mean. Basically, the reason that tool isn't able to shake the piston head as much anymore is because the game engine is considering all of these subgrids as having one combined mass for calculations of inertia. So that drill now is trying to push against the inertia of the entire base to try and create shake, not just the drill and the piston part it's attached to. That's why things are more stable. It can make some things more stable. It also means that these pistons are now having to push the whole mass of this station when they're trying to move somewhere. So with share inertia tensor on, you may find that your pistons or your rotors as they have the same toggle may not be able to move all of the blocks because the combined mass is now too much for them. And that may be when you have to increase your maximum impulse axis and maximum impulse non-axis. In the case of a drill rig, you're usually pretty safe, unless you've made a very large one, to have share inertia tensor on for all of the blocks. If you find that you're struggling to get things to move, the block that I would turn share inertia tensor off for is the one directly attached to the base. You can see that we still don't have much shake with that one off. And we'll leave it off and send this drill down into the ground. To do that, we would want this piston to retract and these two to extend. One of the things to keep in mind though is that voxels get removed at a fairly slow rate. If we push this down too fast, so if I set this speed to minus two, our drill is gonna hit into the ground each time before it removes the next bit of voxel. And that's not good. With a larger drill, this could be quite dangerous and could end up damaging our drill head. Plus, the hole that it removes isn't quite as large as it could be. You can see, or you may get a slight impression of it, that the area where the drill is currently sitting is wider than the area right here at the top. And if I were to move this out slowly, we'll clear out a little bit of that material. If you're using a larger construction, the speed that I've found is relatively safe for most sizes is 0.4 meters per second. So if we were just gonna move one at a time, all we'd have to do is put this to minus 0.4, wait till it had extended fully, do 0.4 for the next two, and for the next one and the next one and the next one, 
that's a bit of a slow option. Unfortunately with these three, because one of them's going the opposite direction, the way that I prefer to do things is do all of the ones that have to retract first, then do all of the ones that extend. We have two, so if we extend them both at 0.2 meters per second, they'll safely extend out their combined 20 meters, and the drill will collect all of the stone that it can on its way down. And shouldn't run into anything, which should also make the whole thing a lot more stable. We have a look in our cargo here. Our basic refinery's got stone, our survival kit's got stone, and we're starting to accumulate small amounts occasionally in our small cargo container. You can see, since we started with about one and a half thousand kilos of iron, we are already accumulating a fair bit just from this very simple drill rig. The unfortunate thing about a drill rig like this one is once it's done its extension, it doesn't have anything more it can collect. We have to modify it in some way to make it better. With our drill back in its original position, we have a few options on how we can expand this. We could scrap this whole thing, pop a piston in here sideways, that way we could drill holes down as we move out further and further till we get to the 10 meters and then we'd have a nice long column shaped hole that goes down to the 30 meter extension. Or what we can do is add extra drills onto the side of here. So we could add another drill out here and out to each side and then extend the whole thing down again. If we were going to do that and not add any extra pistons to this, it's probably worthwhile getting rid of this drill and just putting a conveyor junction in the middle. That way you'll save on materials since a conveyor junction is a lot cheaper than a drill. The other option is to remove the drill, add more pistons and push them further down into the ground so that we can dig deeper. There's an advantage to that in that most of what we've drilled here is dirt, so we didn't get as much stone from it as we could have. Down here we're in stone, so we're going to get more for each bit of distance we move forward. The other option to make it go deeper would be to remove this whole thing and add another extended piston up here, followed by a whole bunch of other collapsed pistons ready to push down. So you've got a bunch of different ways you could improve this so that you can collect even more stone. Now I'm going to jump across into creative mode, so let's click save as creative then press Alt F10 and enable creative mode tools. The reason I'm going to do this is because I'm going to build some stuff that's going to explode. And the reason I want to do that is to show you some of the things you need to keep in mind when building with subgrids. So building with pistons or with rotors. So if I start off with a power source like a battery, place it loose, then pop a piston on top. And we need the power source, otherwise we won't be able to make the piston extend. And then we do something that is bad for this piston. Place a few blocks on the side here, and another one on top of it, another couple on this side, and then try and place a block on top of the piston head. You can see that that kind of moved out towards the side, and if we do it from this side, you can see it more clearly. So the reason that's moving is because these three blocks are all trying to occupy some shared space. This block is trying to occupy the same space along its top edge as this one is along its bottom edge, this one along its right edge as this one along its left. That means that the physics engine has to rectify this somehow. Usually that's with pushing them apart. If they can't be pushed apart, that's with exploding them. If we then try and extend this piston, we can generate forces that are bad. I didn't even get a chance to extend this and you can see the weird stuff that's now happening. Because the block on top of the piston is being pushed away by its contact with the other two blocks, and then the piston is trying to push the block back into that position, and neither of these forces can ever be resolved, you end up with what are often called phantom forces, which can result in weird stuff like we're seeing right now. Once you start seeing phantom forces like this, it's really quite common for this to all end in an explosion as things start spinning faster and faster and faster. So how can we avoid this behavior? Well, you don't want the blocks on a subgrid to try and occupy the same space as the blocks on a main grid or on another subgrid. The way to avoid that, if you want to have arrangements like that one, is to we start in the same way again, place that down. I'm going to leave that in the background until it explodes because it could be entertaining. Place a piston on top and instead of using full blocks around this, what we're going to do is place a block down there, block down there, and then use some half blocks. These half blocks don't occupy that same space. So then the block on top is clear to move as it needs to. Those won't interact with each other. There are also some blocks that don't occupy their full cube space. So we've got things like our 
conveyor tubes. And we've also got glass door blocks that don't occupy their full space. So if we grab the glass door blocks, you can see that there are a variety of shapes and each shape has a different edge that it doesn't completely reach. So you can see left to right, this one is not completely reaching there. So if we have this this way, so building these full blocks here is perfectly safe. So if you're going to have blocks right beside a piston, you need to use some of those blocks with smaller collisions so that things can move safely past one another. An important thing to note is that while things like conveyor tubes and blast door blocks on large grid have reduced collision sizes that roughly fit what you can see in front of you, the same is not true for small grid. When we're talking small grid, Things like these small conveyor tubes occupy their full cube volume with their collision mesh. So with small grid, you won't be able to set something up in the same way I have here. So if we start with our piston in the middle, place down some light armor blocks, bring them up along the side here, and then try and place our small conveyor tubes in here. It's either not going to let us, or if it does, it's going to do that because that conveyor tube that I placed before this thing started flying off like the other one is trying to occupy the same space as those armor blocks. If you ever see a vehicle do this, it's almost certainly because a subgrid is trying to occupy the same space as another part of the grid. And that is always something to avoid. So you need to leave for most things on small grid, a full cubes space between nearby parts between parts of a subgrid and parts of the main grid or parts of two subgrids. An example of that is to achieve a similar thing, you would need to place our piston on again. I'm gonna leave a gap this time and then build your armor up along the side here. Then you'll be able to place your conveyor tube on here with no problems whatsoever, but you will not be able to place a block in this space. As soon as I do, this thing's gonna start flipping out. Another thing to note about small grid is that pistons on small grid only come in one size and that one size is the small conveyor ports which means they will not be able to pass most components through them. So if you're planning on having something with components flowing through it, you can't use small grid pistons. So now that we've got a couple of piston tumbleweeds, let's go back to our survival mode and we're going to build the connection system for our rover and then upgrade our drill rig to something a little more special. One of the reasons you may want to build a connector attached to a piston is that on large grid, blocks are 2.5 meters in size. That's a fairly big increment to move your connector if you've got a small grid to attach to it. So I can either have it at this height or this height. That's a pretty big margin. It's unlikely in some situations, unless you've planned ahead or in this, or in my case here, gotten lucky, that the connectors will line up properly. What I'm gonna do is get rid of our old connector and grind away this little support platform. And then we're gonna bring some conveyor tubes over to the side here. Since I occupied the one good parking spot with the drill, I'm gonna have to build a few more and a connector underneath. If we bring our vehicle alongside, you'll see that this is not too far off from what we need. This height difference is something we should be able to adjust for with our suspension. And if you're fortunate, that will be what you'll need to do. You won't need to place a piston on this connector. So let's build this up. So with that built up, hop in the cockpit, jump to our second hotbar and let's drop our suspension down. And we should hopefully be able to squeeze under that connector. Like so. So with our suspension right bottomed out, we can fit under this connector. But what if we didn't want to have to adjust our suspension every time? Then we can use a piston to adjust the height of this connector. So we'll grind away this connector and the stuff attached to it. And we can place a vertical piston anywhere along this course. Because these conveyor tubes will pass happily by other blocks, we could put a piston in here, followed by our conveyor tubes going off to the side like they were before. And these tubes will pass happily by these blocks here. But instead of doing that, what we're going to do is raise this up high enough to fit a downward facing piston. That should be high enough. Come off to the side here 
And in case we want to work on this segment later, let's make the distal part of it attached to this post by a conveyor junction like that. And we can put another two bits out here, put our curve on, and then put our piston in. Piston and connector on the bottom. With the connector and the piston built, this will still provide power so we can test out and see if this works, even though it won't be able to move any of the stuff inside the truck. So if we move this forward, park it just about underneath, just like that, we can then head into our piston here. And the way I like to do this is set our maximum distance down very low. So let's put it to 0.5 meters and then hit reverse. So it's going to extend at 0.5 meters per second. This way, we can gradually extend this bit by bit until it's at the right height. So it can probably go another 50 centimeters. Let's move it out to maximum distance of a meter. Remembering control click brings up that dialog for us to enter a value directly. A little bit closer. Let's go another 20 centimeters. Maximum distance 1.2. There we go, we're in lock range, but let's bring it even closer to make sure that the lock is easier to achieve. Let's bring it another 20 centimeters, 1.4. There we go, we're pretty much smack on top of it. That's about perfect. And we were able to do that without any risk to the vehicle getting crushed by the piston because we had the maximum range under control. I have my truck, and have my connectors on the hopper. You can see the locked one will be the rear one and the ready to lock is our yellow one. We can then lock to the base and we can get charge from the base. So that's how you can use a piston to get your connector at the correct height. When you're talking about connectors on small grid vehicles, the ones that are the most difficult to get the correct height are ones oriented horizontally like that. If we have a look at where this lines up on a block with our base here, you'll see that that height works out reasonably well thanks to the terrain. But if I was up on blocks myself, that connector would have been at about this height, roughly halfway between this block and the next. And that would be a problem because that's very difficult to adjust with suspension height. You could probably only get down to about here, which may not be low enough to connect. So pistons on your base connector can be a nice way to do this. And the reason you'd use pistons on your base connector, not a piston on your small grid ship connector is that components can pass through the large grid pistons, but not through the small grid ones. With our mining hauler connected up, I'm gonna talk you through one last little tip that can be very, very handy early on in the game. I'm not gonna go through how rotors work, but we are going to use one. Get rid of the drill. And instead of building a drill on the end of this, first build an advanced rotor. So if we grab our advanced rotor, place that on here and grind away our rotor part. Once our rotor is constructed, we can then hop into our control panel, find our advanced rotor and select add small head. And also to keep this simple, we're going to share inertia tensor and rotor lock this thing. Now what we've got is a small grid attached to a large grid. This means instead of having to build a large grid drill, which takes 180 steel plate, we can build a small grid drill, which takes just 20. Not too much difference in the construction components, but in the everything else, the large grid drills are much more expensive, yet don't drill out that much bigger, that much larger an area. But we have another problem. Small grid drills only have small ports and we've got a large port here. So grab your conveyor junction, this large one, make sure one of the large ports lines up to the rotor head and pop it on there. Now we have access to small ports. To bring them around to the center again, you're going to need to add some of these small conveyors on. We can now attach our small grid drills. We can either attach them side by side or to make things a little more efficient, you can place an extra piece in between each one. So these three drills are going to drill out a wider area, not quite as wide in this dimension, but much wider in this and cost less than half the steel of a large grid drill. Large grid drills are so much more expensive than small grid drills that for the price of one large grid drill in terms of its iron content, you can build more than five small grid ones. You can almost build six. It's such a big difference. 
so you can drill out a whole lot more of the ground with far fewer resources required. Especially beneficial for early on in the game. And with those welded up, let's get this thing going. Grab our drills, which will be these three. Turn them on. Our first piston, reverse. Now the only reason I put this central drill here was to show how you would build this if you hadn't already drilled the hole with the large grid. Since we already have that hole in the center, we don't really need to use this central drill. We could have just left it out and gone without having that there. Since we already have a hole all the way down to the maximum extension of our pistons. Now that, that one's finished, let's grab the other two and extend them. And now you can see a little bit of what I was talking about when pushing stuff too fast. This is running into the ground. And that's at just point four. Sometimes you will need to go a little bit slower. So let's drop this down to 0.1 for each of them. And that'll mean our combined speed is just 0.2 meters per second. So there you go, a nice simple drill rig and a slightly more complex one that allows you to get small grid drills onto your large grid base to save yourself a whole bunch of resources. Next time, what we're going to do is use all the resources we've collected to make something that's capable of getting us all the way off this planet and up into space. So there's all that and plenty more to come and I will see you then.